love this time of year. So this is lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, spinach. These are all things that love everything about spring. They want it to be bright and just chilly. They want to like snow. They're happy with that. So you've got two distinct seasons. You've got spring, starts in March, and then usually sometime in May it turns, then you go into summer. And the way you know the difference is if it forms a fruit, pumpkins, squash, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, these are all summer plants. If you're harvesting the actual fruit, that's probably summer plant. If you're harvesting the foliage or the flower, like broccoli, you're actually eating the flower, or Brussels sprout, you're eating the, off the stems, or cauliflower, it's a big old flower. If you're harvesting uh, spinach, uh, many of the root crops, those things like the spring, they actually don't like some. But if you wait to plant those until after Mother's Day, they'll want the bolt on it. They'll go into flower. You get an off flavor. You get kind of this bitter taste. They taste better when it's cool. They keep that flavor. They get a sweeter taste to it. So really, you've got very two distinct planting seasons in the mountains of Arizona. It starts in March. You're planting through now, through May. And then you switch, and many times you can pull those spring things out. If you're into square foot gardening or raised beds or containers. You can pull those out and now you free up space to put. So a classic example would be peas. I plant peas very early and they like the cold. Peas like the cold. They're not gonna do well in the summer. So there I'll grow those up. I'll harvest all my snap peas, sweet peas, anything a pea in it. Um, and then I'll pull those things out. And I put beans in. Beans do not like spring. They like heat. They like summer. They glow when it's 100 degrees out. They're happy. So there's 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 time. There's timing for it. But again, maybe we should put on remind me. We'll we'll give them the garden calendar too. So we've got a calendar. It's not something download. Google drives me crazy. If you research anything online, much less much less Chat GPT and AI, whatever they're talking about today, you will be done. We need local garden information for up here because we are different. The curse you have is, this is truly a curse, Phoenix controls the news channel, news sites for us. Anything they grow down there, just kind of anything they're telling you, as soon as they mention palm trees and figs, it's just, just stop listening. It's not good advice. Go to something else. We are a known seven. Flat out. So what does that mean? We need plants to go down about 10 degrees. Okay. So that's the zone seven. 10, 15. Uh, but that also means that you can grow zone seven when you're reading the tags. It's a zone. So it tells you what zone. So you, you can grow zone seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That zone or lower, you can grow. As soon as you go to eight, okay, that's going to be Dewey, Mayer, Cottonwood, Camberti, okay, it's so cold, they go, they go down to 15, instead of 10, that's the difference. They still get frost, but how much antifreeze does that plant have in the structure of that plant before it freezes and dies? That's what we're really measuring. So as you, I flirt strongly with zone eight in my gardens. I'm, I'm definitely zone seven, but I'm a gardener, and gardeners, you know what you're talking, you know what I'm talking about. You don't tell us what we can or cannot do. You're wrong, that's it. And I want to grow this, so I will. So I flirt with zone seven pretty good, and I do some tricks that I kind of play around with. We are not a zone nine. That's Black Kingdom City, Phoenix 10. I mean, we're, they never see cold ever. So that's going to be more like your tropical. So zone seven. Yeah, it's, keep having that hand on. Is it too late to plant root vegetables? It's not too late to, to plant root vegetables. You're good, good to go. Put the radishes in. We'll we'll cover to session planning and stuff. Okay, so we've covered the. Let's start with tomatoes. I would not recommend putting tomatoes in this week. I would wait. I encourage you, for the love of gardening, please wait. Uh, but I know some of you are going to go anyway. So just no telling you to not. I'm in no hurry to plant my tomatoes because they do not like to go below fifty degrees. Plus, every night, even when it's not frosty, it's, it's cold. And the ground is not warm yet. It's all about ground temperature really needs to be up in that 45, 50 degrees before they're happy. 
They not only want the daytime to be warm, they want the nighttime in their soil. This is truly, truly a tropical plant. But everyone gets tricked into putting them in early because they're thinking this is like, it's going to stay. It's not going to stay like this. So they're really sensitive. So with that being said, plant at your garden. Success. I run a garden center. So I live here. I do a lot of hours here. I just live here, basically. I got to get out of my office. I just sleep here. I'm always here. I don't have time to garden, but I love gardening. So I kind of live here through May. At the end of May, June, I'll kind of, I'll finally get around to planting my own personal tomatoes. And I guarantee you, I will catch up to whatever you planted in three weeks earlier. Mine will catch up almost overnight because the ground is warm. I just waited. So don't feel like you're in a hurry. Be in a hurry to plant lettuce. Be in a hurry to plant spinach. Be in a hurry of arugula, parsley. Be in a hurry. Because these things do better when it's cool. So you got another month, six weeks while they can really produce. I mean, you put lettuce in right now, it's you'll be harvesting it like tomorrow. It's, it grows that quick because it's super happy this time of year. Another one that I brought was this first crop of lemongrass. This is a very difficult herb to find. When you see some of these things, you need to grab them while you see them because they won't be here like the next day. So there's some certain the specialty things are sort of like that. Grab them while you can. Okay. So I brought this one. This one I use a lot. This is sautés. There's just a lot of uses for it, but also this repels mosquitoes. So if you put them in containers around the patio, and let's say I'm going out to uh, I use this one in scented geraniums for myself. We love our back patios, north facing the dells. It's beautiful. The sunsets are glorious. Butterflies, hummingbirds. There's fairies out there. I mean, it's just so beautiful. And so we go out and enjoy it. What destroys that? Mosquitoes and flies. Those two things are not welcome. And so I'll go out and we're having a gathering. And I'll just hose down just the sun is setting. The, the boats are coming out. If you put a light bit of, of moisture, hose, water on this, on your scented geraniums, on your marigolds, it releases, you'll smell it. And it just pushes the mosquitoes off the deck or patio or whatever you're at. There's, there's secrets, there's little ways you can like keep, and then, then you don't need as much heat, awful. So just there's ways to treat that. Hold on, let me, I'm not going to too many, let me go to questions. Before I go to questions, are there so many people a hunter of you? I'll get overwhelmed, we'll be here for hours. Let's go tomatoes. And you Midwest folks, I, I feel for you, I, I, I sense your pain. You cannot grow a tomato the size of your head here in Prescott, Arizona. It's really, really hard. And it's because of cold nights. Unless you had a greenhouse, you cheat it early or get it going, um, you're better off finding a medium size tomato or smaller ones. And here's the reason why. So if it has the name big or beef or large or humongous or grows the size of your head, you got to be a serious gardener to get that thing to go. Because it's what happens is the nights get so cool that the plants actually shut down. They stop growing. Whereas in more consistent temperatures like the Midwest, Alaska, put them in the ground, they grow 24-7, day and night. I mean, they just grow. Here, they only grow for about six hours a day. And it gets really, even in July, it can really get cool. These plants kind of shut down, so they don't grow as consistently. So we are famous, I mean, truly famous for having a big tomato plant, brandy wine, loaded with huge tomatoes, big green tomatoes. And we're about to get our first frost. That's what we're famous for. And so if you planted some early growth, celebrities, champions, San Diego's, there's all these medium sizes you would have been harvesting those since from August on. So don't be don't 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 be fooled into I gotta have the really big ones because I remember my grandfather making me a tomato sandwich with one slice. <laughs> Maybe that's not that was in Georgia. It's here, so it might be there. That's just some advice I kind of give you. Also cherries, um, um, yellow pears, sweet one hundreds, these smaller ones, they produce like crazy here. I mean, they just Hundreds, it's ridiculous how many tomatoes it come off of. So if you're into salads or just pop them in from the gardens, it's a great choice. Okay. We gotta cover hybrids. 
heirlooms, what does that all mean? Okay. We are only going to sell here Waters Gardens. Here's what we stand for. Nothing is genetically modified. So non-GMOs, everything is organic, even if it's not labeled organic, it's organic. Uh, so that's just kind of what we stand for. So it's not going to be anything altered. No, no, we're not going to juice them in and chemicals. We're just not going to do that. That's what the box stores do. That you're not shopping at box stores. This is mom and pop that we stand for organics and that kind of stuff. Also, I don't like killing birds, children, grandkids. That's all those things. And when you dip it in metacloprin, that's not good for you. Genet changing genetic, you can you can have, I mean, let's give them you know, only six bucks. Look at that. This is lettuce, so easy to grow. You can hardly, if you find it at the store, it's crazy expensive. So much better than iceberg for you. Anytime you get this color to it, you get to increase your antioxidants. The health of it is so much better. And you can do this yourself. This is one you want to plant really good. Right? Plant while it's cool. If we get frost, don't cover it. It wants to be exposed. If it snows, don't protect it. It wants to keep, it wants to, it wants the cold. Okay, this is a if it get it's leafy, if you're harvesting the foliage. It's probably going to be a spring plant that likes the cold. Okay, so lettuce. This I think is oak, red oak leaf lettuce. I actually don't know, but it looks like oak leaf lettuce. Yeah, it's got the shape of an oak leaf. Anyway, there's a bunch of lettuces out here right now. The other one is we're into juicing and stuff. I mean, just anytime you see stems like this, this is the healthiest thing you could possibly want to consume for yourself. Um, you just can't beat this. Chuck Swiss chard. I plant these in my flower gardens because they're just pretty. Look at that. It's just glorious. And then I can harvest and eat it if I want to. So we, we're big into juicing stuff and that kind of stuff. This is great kale, same way. We're big into kale, juicing, that kind of super healthy. Okay, so plant early. Again, this is your fo you're harvesting the foliage. This is one you plant March, April, first part of May. So the big mistake I find a lot of folks, newbies make. They're coming in, they're finally ready. It's now Mother's Day, because everyone tells them Mother's Day, a non-gardener tells you, don't plant until Mother's Day. As soon as they say that, you go, oh, they're not a gardener. Check, got it. And I have to listen to what they're saying. They're a summer, they only plant a tomato, and it's only in the summer. True gardeners, we plant 12 months out of the year. You can harvest vegetable edibles out of your gardens, parsley, kale, 12 months out of the year, because we're so mild. So it's just, and then we get some we get some storms, but it's it melts pretty quick. Then it gets nice again. So you can have that. All right. So we did tomatoes, medium size. Ah, here's the other one. Because the night is so cool, uh, we're, we're notorious. Again, notorious is going to be, uh, we're, we're gearing up now, ready for the, the, the hordes of gardeners that are coming in. Uh, my tomatoes this big. There's not, there's not blooming. What's going on? It's not setting fruit. What's happening? And it's your fault. Okay, got here. Let's help. We can help you. So what happens is you're juicing your gardens right now. A whole bunch, a bunch of nitrogen fertilizers. The ground is just really set to go. Tomatoes feed off of that. They love nitrogen. They will feed off all those manures and they will just grow like crazy. I mean, they will be up like this by the end of June. They'll be like, Grr. if they're not producing flowers, if they're not setting fruit, here's what I do. When I'm buying my, with my peppers, squash, uh, tomatoes especially, I get one of each of these. Start with tomato and pepper set. This is a this is not a pollinator. What happens is tomatoes literally grow so fast they forget what they're what they're here to do. They literally forget to set flowers. They're just they're focused on grow, 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 grow. That's all they're they're doing. What what tomato set does? You're not spraying the flowers. You're spraying the entire plant. So I see, I see the boxers have this cute little eight ounce size of like, oh my gosh, that's not even close to enough. I go out and every other week, I spritz my tomato plants with this. And I'm spraying on the foliage. What it does, it slows the growth down. So it, it has a breath, just kind of lets it set back and go, oh, 
oh, it's grown so fast. Maybe I should set a flower. All of a sudden, it starts growing well. flower. I'll start hitting them with the, with the uh, tomato and pepper set, starting when they're about knee high. They're about the size. But okay, I think you're old enough, you're mature enough to set a flower. Let's try it. So I'll just spritz the foliage out in the morning with my coffee, and I just kind of spritz the top of foliage. That's good. Okay, if you happen to hit a butterfly, it's safe for butterflies. Don't worry about bees. They're going to be fine. Just get them on the plant. This helps them slow down. I do this for my fast-growing things. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, it can really help. It's more than just for just tomatoes and peppers. Uh, um, for my squash, they're notorious for starting to grow, then they, get, they, they fade, they get yellow, and they fall off. This would help with that. Now, in addition, I get this, yield booster. What we have is, because our water is so crazy alkaline, that pause is different. So everywhere else in the country is very acidic. So you're adding uh, lime to the soil. Lime sweetens the soil. Have you ever heard this? You read a magazine right now. It was much put, much, much, must put lime on the gardens or it's, you won't have sweet soils. Don't do that here. You'll kill your plants. Just don't do it because your water is already doing that for you. If anything, we're doing the opposite. We're adding soil sulfur. Sulfur is the opposite of lime. Sulfur makes things more acidic. And here's why everything's just garden trivia, just because, just again, we're just friends. <laughs> and I like trivia. Thumb beauty is an old volcano core. That's why it looks so funny. All the ash that was over that core has settled down, and now we are gardening in that, all that ash. A Glassford Hill, for you folks out in the valley area. Glassford Hill, that's a volcano. All the ash that was there is now settled down in the valleys, now we're gardening in that. And if you are gardening in it, we stuck a straw on the ground, we call it a well. And now we're sucking all this water through the ash that's now tainted the water to be more alkaline. And now you're putting that onto your plants. And so you'll be struggling with your pH differently than you were anywhere else in the country. Just like Albuquerque, Durango, this, this little part of the Southwest, this little bubble, we're the only ones. Everyone else is acidic. And so if you know that, what, and here's an indication that your pH has crept too high. You folks have had pools and hot tubs, you're always checking the pH, because if you crawl in it and it's off, you kind of come out and your skin feels like it wants, wants to crawl off your body. Well, that's what your roots look like on your plants. The pH gets off. So you're testing that. I just guarantee you don't have to test it. I'm telling you, you've got very high pH. Always try to push it down, always. And so um, what that does, if your pH gets too high, it locks up all the calcium and iron. So your plants will tend to yellow on you. There will be, there'll be this rush into June. You'll be watering a lot. People will be coming in going, I need iron. Right? I need iron and stuff. You don't really, let's, let's try to help you over here. Let's get you some sulfur. That'll release the iron that's already there. And it'll be better for the long run for you. So we'll try to guide you as best we can. But if you just got to have it, we're going to sell it to you. Because I got to I get bills to pay. So, but, but generally, you kind of want sulfur would be better than an iron product. Uh, what happens with the uh, um, calcium, it locks up the calcium. Plants need calcium, or you get to where the flower touches, let's say a tomato, where the flower touches, it'll start to rot. We call it, we call it blossom in rot. That's a classic lack of calcium. So I know that, I see this in my gardens often, um, so I'm always trying to add calcium as I am gardening. So I'm going to add gypsum. Just gypsum is calcium sulfate. Lowers the pH and it's calcium. It's like a damn. That's like that's like two birds with one stone, one package. So I'm always when I plant a tomato, I'll put a little bit of calcium sulfate gypsum underneath the roots, kind of kick some some soil over, plant my plant. So the roots are growing through the calcium. In addition. This is just, you're going to struggle with this. Just telling you. Um, I will spritz my foliage every couple of weeks with, with yield booster. This is just liquid calcium. Calcium is actually really hard to get into the plants. And so when they say put bone meal, that adds calcium. That's true, it does. It's, it's ground up chicken bones. With cal that's what bone meal is. You're putting bone meal in your gardens, not for this year. 
takes forever for bone to break down in the gardens. You really put it in the gardens for next year. It just doesn't act fast enough. This is like immediately available to your plants. So if you start to see the fruits forming, you see any kind of blossom in rot, just hit it with this. And so I will once a week, look, I love my therapy is flower grower. I love going out with my coffee and I just like deadheading flowers and communing with butterflies. That's my, that's my thing. And then I'll do the same thing with my vegetables. So while I'm out there, I will hit it one week with the yield booster, next week with uh, blossom set. Just once a week, just light mist. You're not soaking in the ground, just light mist the foliage. Don't focus on the flower, that's a mistake. That will up your game dramatically. This year, it'll be game changer. It'll set fruit faster and they'll be bigger. Calcium makes things sweeter, better tasting, and larger. You have more of them, which a lot of benefits to calcium. Okay. All right, tomatoes, make sure I got all that. I think we got it. I do have, so uh, if you're going to try to do any kind of planting of summer plants, this is highly recommended. So I've got a whole bundle of these. Maybe you have 10 or 15. I don't know. I've got a big pile of them. This is a plant protector. They used to call it uh, walls of water. These little tubes, you fill the tubes up with water, put it over your plant, and it collapses on top of the plant, and it creates a little uh, a teepee. Because it's a greenhouse. So as the water warms up, it warms up the soil, and then as water freezes, it releases energy to so keep your plants warm. So if I literally had my tomatoes growing up through the top of these stand about this tall. They're growing up, they're, they're like this, and snow, it snowed on my plants, and they lived. Plant protect, if you're gonna start early and you don't have a greenhouse, this is highly advised. Okay, so there's three of them in a package. You can reuse them for years. Mine are kind of skanky and gross. They got algae and stuff in them. It doesn't matter. I just don't care. I nor do I, because as soon as we're done, with this uh, old nights, I'm going to pull these things off, let them dry out as best I can, and I store them next year. So plant protectors really do work. Uh, likewise, I brought this insulator because we're going to get another frost. Guaranteed, you're going to get another frost. Guaranteed. Probably tonight. Um, if your fruit trees, if things that you're worried about might get damaged by cold, cover them with a frost cover. Okay. So I bring this mainly because I see too many folks making mistakes by using plastic. Don't use plastic. You need breathable material. When it gets cold, what happens is that cold permeates and then almost does more damage and good. If it can't breathe, that cold sticks around the plant and it does doubles down as the damage. Use a breathable material, sheets, quilts, parkas. I had a customer, they, they, they took their old hats, they just turned over their plants on the night. But that's a brilliant that's, So you get creative. I've seen gloves at the top of plants. I do a break, but I've seen just about all of it. These man, they're just kind of a, I know you're going to be worried. You're going to see some more frost. First of all, for leafy things, don't worry. It'll cover them. I see people overprotecting. They're planting new peonies. They're planting new, these things don't care. They like the cold. But your summer plants, just remember, Mother's Day is that, Demarcation on you folks in uh, Prescott Valley, you got it made because your last frost date is not May 8th, it's May 6th. So you get two more days. The same, I mean, Chino Valley thinks they're so much better than us. We're all the same. We're the same zone, the same pool, the same party. What really comes to play is are you in north, south, east, west facing? That plays more into your gardens. And what elevation? Okay, so yeah, if you're up on Highland Pines or Blue Creek or the high elevation, maybe you're a week later, but most of us are pretty much within days of each other the same. What we'll get you is uh, the best gardens are on the east facing, east side of the hill, because it's cold at night. That sun pops up and it warms up really fast. The north, I'm on the north side, and I just got rid of the last pile of snow. I mean, it just stuck around forever. It was so cold. It was icy. It's not nice. It's a two-story house. North, north slope, you don't look at the dells. It's cold. It's beautiful during the, during the growing season. 
because it's so nice. You just go home and you have that shade to get rid of the wind. It's great. But in the winter, it's pretty brutal. Um, so I don't know why I shared that, but anyway, just some oh, we're southeast west. That'll make more of a difference. If you have a choice, east side or south side are the best. Actually, east or west probably are ideal. South can be just brutally hot. You just have to water things. Um, so uh, the north side is going to be a challenge. North side, that's where you grow your leafy things. Because they're going to take that shaded area better, let's say, a summer thing. Also, be careful of big, tall plants like corn. Tomatoes are big plants. You're going to get the big varieties. If you plant them on that south side, all of a sudden they're shading all the rest of the gardens. Plant those really tall things on the north side. So they're shading that. So you've got your, you've got the sun. You're, you're, you're sharing that sun with the rest of the gardens. That's because a lot of us are dealing with raised beds or, or square foot gardens, what I call it. Uh, so you can, you can strategize that. Another one is I grow giant pumpkins. That's my thing. Um, flowers. Actually, I got some kind of salsa garter. Has several issues. <laughs> giant pumpkins are one of them. Okay. So I usually put that one plant or two plants or three plants at the edge of my raised beds so they can grow out and do that way. So they're using the irrigation, the soil and things from the gardens, but they're taking up space over here. By the end of the monsoon season, it look, looks like, like Jurassic Park. I mean, it's like there's like plants everywhere. And then if you want to impress grandkids, you pick a pumpkin like this, they're awesome. You need a wheelbarrow to get it to the front to the front door. That's 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 a like that's that's impressive. And so you can grow those pretty easy. You're not you're never gonna grow. I can't seem to figure out how to grow a thousand pound pumpkin, but I can sure grow a hundred pounder pretty easy, and you can too. And that is a summer plant. I'm not even thinking about putting those in until middle of May or June. So it's way, way, way too early. So wait on some of those things. It's frost, I'll hit that, it'll, it'll obliterate it just like that. All right, I had one more issue with tomatoes. Oh, I got it. Tomatoes, it's another insider tip. So we're famous for, just because I'm spending more time on that one because it's the number one plant. How many people are gonna grow a tomato this year? Yeah, everyone. Like, of course you are. And if you did raise your hand, you should be in shame of yourself. So um, one thing that we do, especially the medium and bigger sized tomatoes, so um, they'll swell up with water in the morning and then they'll shrink during the day. And this swelling, the fruit does this. When it does that, you'll get cracking in the skin or the skin can get very tough or rigid or just, they did. it changes the, the texture of that fruit. And it's between the morning, it's the water. It's, it's that moist to dry, moist to dry. It's not good on the fruit. If you can even that out, you're better. What do I do? So I make a product called Aqua Boost Crystals. These are polymers. So they hold like 200 times their weight in water. So as I'm planting, I'm sprinkling some of this at the base of my tomatoes, my plant basically. So the roots go in there. So these, this will hold the moisture at the root level and admit it where it evens out the moisture for my plants. And I get less of that cracking, thick skin, they're sweeter. Uh, better. So that's an insider tip I think will help you a lot with your bigger, if you want big pumpkins, you got to have some of this. That's how you get, because if it gets dry, it'll take the moisture from the fruit to keep the plant alive, the, the heart of the, the main mother plant alive. This is a real game changer in dry climates. This really helps. Containers, if you're doing container gardening, this really helps because containers dry out faster. So you sprinkle some of this in that upper layer where the roots are. They're going to hold. They're going to swell up, hold up moisture, um, and then and then release it as the plant needs it. I used to put this into my hay baskets, but I'm going to help my customers. I'm going to help them figure out how to make these things that didn't have to water so much. I've had this. Yeah, everyone was griping about me. Like, what are these things in the soil? I don't want that. This is these are snail eggs. Oh my gosh! I kind of okay. Stick, not to sell. Take that out. They're on their own. They got to buy their own their own crystals. But it really is a game changer, leveling out the moisture, so you'll get better fruits. It's aqua boost crystals. Okay. 
let's talk herbs for a moment just because I'm looking at them. Um, so we grow herbs like no one else. Uh, you've got most of them are perennials. This is the sage that all the chefs want. They can't get enough fresh sage. This is the easiest plant in the world to grow. And javelina, deer, rabbits, things don't eat herbs. Basil, some fennel, most herbs animals don't eat. Okay? Especially the, the common ones you eat, rosemary, lavender, uh, sage, thyme, they don't bother. And, and they're perennial. Plant them once, you're going to harvest them for years. There's no reason you should be spending $5.99 more for a little tiny bunch of old, three week old herbs. You should be able to pick it fresh from the garden. So for us, I've got a classic two story house. You dug in the side of the hill, you walk in the upstairs, you walk down, you got a flight and a half of stairs, get to the whole property. Um, and so you go from the driveway to the backyard, there's a whole set of stairs. Every step, I just said, okay, I'm going to make a, everyone's a, a garden. I've got a different herb on every step. And that's our herb garden. It's beautiful, super, super easy, put on drip irrigation. I almost forget it's there until I'm making some salsa, or I need some oregano, or then I go out and go, no, oh, there it is. And I just pop it out. There we go. It's, it's literally that easy. The one to be careful of is this one. This is the biggest wimp I have ever met. This is a wuss. Basil does not like growing here because it's so cold in the spring. So if you're gonna plant basil, have a greenhouse or wait until you're planting your tomatoes or some of you. This loves the heat in the summer. The big mistake folks make, this does not like cold soil either. So wait till it's warmer and it will thrive and just be really great but it doesn't really grow until the summer hits and then it takes off. So you can, most, a lot of folks plant too early their basil. I've got it because I'm dealing with a lot of gardeners. Gardeners are, are a, they, they've got some pride. I mean, they, you all have pride. So I, you're at a, a cocktail party and it's, it's July and you picked your first tomato. You're going, hey, I just picked my first tomato. It's so good. Gosh, how are you doing with your gardens? Loser. <laughs> so it's bragging rights. We want to have that. I just picked my first one. So there's so I'll start a few early, but I don't commit my whole garden to it. I'll just start a few of my my plant protectors. Most of the garden is still dedicated to kale. I can't pick up fast enough. Spin, uh, Swiss chard, I cannot pick fast enough. Parsley, I cannot pick fast enough. It's just coming off like crazy. I'll wait on some of my summer. So watch this one. Uh, dill will be a little sensitive that way. Oops. Um, anyway, just something to watch. Um, I would say these I use a lot. Oregano is like a weed, literally a weed. So these grow like crazy. Um, I use the gold one a lot. They taste the same. They have the same flavor in the kitchen. Um, this one's just pretty. So I, I use it in the edge of my containers. A lot of people want to use that uh, trailing vinca, the myrtle, or, or that trailing evergreen, the blue flower. It's a weed, it chokes out everything. This doesn't choke out anything, and it smells good. It's pretty, it combines with, I mean, look at that, that's just pretty. Oh my gosh, it looks good. And so now you, you can have, we are not dealing with our grandparents' gardens. You don't have to march tomato plants through the yard like soldiers. We can have one by the front door and spray paint, I spray paint my tomato cage, different colors, because it's pretty and it's artistic. But by the front door, because a plant that has a fruit on it like this, that's not just edible, that's beautiful. And so it's just pretty, people are always coming, oh gosh, you're such a gardener. Yeah, just spray paint a tomato cage, be fine. Not our tent artistry, it's just fun. So we can think outside the box sometimes. Um, I'll frequently plant these at the uh, base of my, uh, my, my tomatoes because they do repel insects as well. They keep a uh, great big old tomato worm. The worms get huge here. If you've ever seen a moth that flies around, like a, a, it looks like a hummingbird, go to this hummingbird. I got it close, you got this real long proboscis, it's a moth. 
That is a Sphinx moth. She's the culprit. She's the reason you have huge tomato worms. That's, that's the larva stage of that, that insect is that caterpillar. And so that we're pretty famous for growing like record sizes. So I think they, they, if you leave your keys out, they'll pick them up and start driving the car off. They're huge. When you pick them up, they spit at you and stuff. So they're real happy in me. So anyway, I used to pick them off, put them in a can, give them to the boys, go, hey, boys, it is. yeah, just make sure they're dead and done. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. So, yeah. See, we got you covered. Yeah. And, okay. Stories we tell. I've raised four kids out of this garden center. So it's kind of when the boys were small, like, hey, we need some worms. You'd spend hours underneath looking underneath the tree buckets because worms like it underneath there. We take home buckets full of them. So it's just so easy to entertain kids. Gardening, if you want to connect generations. Vegetable gardening, just gardening period, is a real way to do it. So we've got my notice garden guy in my family, and then I have garden guy junior. And we go butt around. By the time we get to any of these blackberries, the hands are just like black. Face is just great until we are sick. So they came over, so and I'll get back to the information. They came over with the holidays and they land, they go, let's go pick stuff. That's instantly it's like it's like December. There's nothing to pick. And so I go, oh, let's go see. Don't, 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 don't. I did find a, a beet in my containers. I pulled it up. And then I dug around where the potatoes were. And there's always one or two. I picked them up and went, there, I want this. How's that for uh, showmanship? Potatoes. Let's go eat them. So anyway, kids, it's easy to connect generations. And outdoors, it's easy to get them to unplug. It's easy to get them to rinse. The other thing I do is I get from Amazon through the grandparents. You can get like arrowheads, nothing. <laughs> I'll get like dozens of them. I go burying them in the yard underneath the rocks. And so they think this is like an old burial, Indian burial ground. Yeah, this used to be an Indian burial ground. There's a massacre here. And so you still have some of the arrowheads. They, yeah, worse. Let's been out there looking for those hours. It's so easy. Um, uh, rosemary, bring this one because you got to be careful with rosemary. This is where that Phoenix curse comes up. So the desert varieties do not grow up here. They'll do just fine. They won't winter over up here. Uh, this is especially true with trailing or carpet varieties. So rosemary come in two types, trailing or prostate. Or, or carpet varieties, they trail over the edge of, in between rocks, over the edge of pots, over the edge of, of uh, raised beds. That's where you use this. Gets the same flower, blue, blooms a couple times a year, has the same flavor. It just grows sideways. You see it's, it's growing, it's just trailing. This, this is all it's going to get. It's going to go like this. There's really only two varieties genetic. There's probably 50 different rosemary types. There's maybe four or five that go up here. That winter over for us. So if you were planted one and went, ah, I can't grow rosemary, it probably wasn't you. You were sold the wrong thing. And that depot buyer, we call it, I won't tell you what we call it internally, and you must drink the juice and take the tattoo before you can work here. So uh, that's where we're anti-box. Uh, we're taking them, we're taking them head on. Um, their buyer's gonna go send, send 50 of those to all my stores. I don't care. You want to buy from my friend, you want to put the right one in that will winter over. This should be a perennial that grows for decades. That's how it should be trailing. It's a good one. Um, then I've got this one. This is upright. So this is one that gets about this tall, kind of like this, ball shaped, evergreen. You see a certain bloom. This is an early pollinator, you pollinators, no bees or butterflies. This is a great one. Bees are coming out now. They are very hungry. They've been hibernating since October. They are very hungry. There's not that much out for it. This is a great pollinator. So anyway, these are two varieties of the great. Another insider tip, just kind of something that helps. If you want to impress your friends, your neighbors, really super easy. These big long stems for this upright one, trim that off, use it as a skewer for like chickens and, and uh, pork. It permeates that, that uh, herbal flavor, permeates from the inside out. You pull it off with the, with the, with the uh, uh, 
rosemary texture still on it. Oh, here, which one do you want? And, Whoa, you are such a gardener. Oh my gosh, that's genius. Drill master. I hardly know how to drill. You know how to impress. It's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. What else? So mostly perennials. You cannot kill. Do not put this in the middle of your garden or there will be nothing but mint left. Mint is a weed here. Just be careful. I like to put this in pots, not in my garden, or I'll be fighting mint forever. So mint, I like one of my prettiest ones. I've got a strawberry mint. This is this is pineapple mint. You probably you probably have. We'll have a dozen varieties or more. Uh, not throughout the season. They're all organic. If you want to taste them, take some leaves. Go ahead, try them. They all have a different frank flavor, uh, texture, kind of. They all have a different scent. Uh, my favorite is I've got a, a um, Japanese maple in a pot on the back patio. Remember, it's north facing, so it's shade, hard shade. Mint takes that, so does Japanese maple. So I put this at the base as an underplanting of my Japanese maple. And so you get this flowing, beautiful, fragrant plant. And mint is one of those that will repel insects like mosquitoes. So I, I hose that down in the evening. It releases this scent and it pushes off the insects, flies, mosquitoes. Okay. We try to get them back there, barbecue with the whole family. First mosquito shows up, every gal, they are indoors, the party, it is over. That's it. And my wife is like a mosquito agent. She just like, they, they love her. So I just go after her. Uh, we do grow asparagus, and asparagus, we do grow asparagus, and artichokes as well. Those are both perennials. They'll grow, come back year after year. So when you're, you need to be strategizing, you don't want to just put this in your garden that you till over here. But think we're going to put this where I don't have to disturb it. Same with rhubarb. An in, in, interesting uh, tidbit with rhubarb. We are in hail country. You will get a hail storm. Well, hail just shreds, just destroys rhubarb. And it'll still grow, it didn't kill it, it just makes it terrible. And so I put my rhubarb just underneath. I've got a huge alligator juniper, ginormous one. I put it just underneath the canopy so it protects my, I'm using this plant to protect my garden. And so there's those secret you can kind of do. You can also build structures like a shade cloth, kind of keep you out. But you, you, it's possible to have some hail during the monsoon season. That's usually end of July, August, September, does you got this rainy season that happens. Just be aware that you might have to protect things then. I really don't like artichokes. Please do not have me over and serve me artichokes. I will gag. But I do grow artichokes. That's, that's a, I know it's offensive to California. It's, what do you mean? I grew up on an artichoke farm. I don't care. I don't need them. Uh, this one I do grow, though. Because it's got the most beautiful prehistoric flower, because you're eating the flower. So I let it go into bloom, and it's just this funky, cool plant that screams like I should be from the dinosaur age. So it just is a neat, neat, interesting plant, especially in containers. It's got lots of big structures. I brought this one for you because it's a so lavender. This is another one I should probably share. This is a vegetable and herb class. So there's three kinds of lavenders, okay? There's Spanish lavender, that's the famous one. That's this one. This is the one that's always in the front of magazines. So it's got the great big flower. I brought this one because it's got the white, white to ears on it. Very unusual. You're only gonna find this at Water Scarves. <laughs> Serious, you're only gonna find it here. Because uh, it's a funky thing, we get bored with plants and we like new things. So this is a, a, a different kind of, of Spanish lavender. Spanish is the wimpiest of all the lavenders. If you look at this with a wet, cold winter, it's gonna die. So the other one is French lavender. I didn't bring a sample of all of them. French lavender, that's the next hardiest one. That's one they use in potpourri. It's got the most fragrance. It's pretty, but it's not that pretty. I mean, the foliage is beautiful. It's thick, voluptuous. It's got a lot of oils in it, but it's 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 not quite as hardy. The hardiest of all in the landscape, you want to plant English lavender. 
That's one that's got gets up about this tall, is these thin, wispy kind of flowers to it. Blue, typically blue. That's English lavender. I've got all of those over there, but you just know there's three types Spanish. That's the one you see. If you see a magazine, you came and you're going, Oh, I saw this. I want this one. You're there. You're there. You're better choices, but here it is. Uh, then you got, if you're into really into oils and potpourries and that stuff, French lavender. And then English lavender is one. It's the hardest one. You can't kill English lavender. So that's where we brought that. They're typically evergreen. Uh, they keep their foliage around. I just kind of trim them, shape them a little bit, give them a haircut. That's all you got to do. For Pretty easy to grow. If you kill lavender, it will be you overwater it, guaranteed. Oh, another insider tip. This is it's just me. Here's my tip. It's what I found over the years. Uh, I try not to harvest my herbs early in the morning when they're just hydrated. The, the, the flavor isn't quite as good. Uh, I find they taste better when they're dry a little bit. So I'll wait to harvest my oreganos or thymes, rosemaries. Kind of 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock, kind of later, let them warm up, let them dry out some flavor. Better. Just, I don't know why. And I think they're just too plump, too moist, too much water early. And when they dry out, the, the, the fragrance comes down better. Just don't do that with your vegetables. Vegetables are best picked in the tree. Also, water to cover that. And you're going to get more than you, than, you, than you wanted here. Sorry, just going to keep going. I could go all day, it's what I do for a living. Uh, water in the morning, especially vegetables that are forming fruits, water in the morning. Do not, for the love of garden, please stop watering at night. That's the curse of Phoenix. When it's 100 degrees out at midnight, you should leave. Who lives 10 miles from the sun? That's crazy. Come up to God's country where it cools off. If you water in the evening here, Britain will have a rainstorm. Late in the day, especially in the, when the things are really growing, July, August, September, you, you're going to be wet. And when things stay wet and cool at night, you get mildews, leaf spots. I will make so much money off of you trying to correct all of these spots and disease issues. You kind of want to water in the morning so plants are hydrated before the heat of the day. And then they go into the evening dry. So you, so you control some of that disease issues. It's going to be, it's going to help you a lot. I'm just telling you, big mistake. Every down in Phoenix, they water like 10 o'clock at night because it's too hot to water any other time. It's nuts. Don't, you're not down there. You're up here. So different. Okay. So I did cover a couple things. One of my favorites, this will be in the, the garden column that I wrote today. Um, this is calendula. This is one of my favorite plants. This is the whole plant is out of it. But if you want to impress your friends, take some flowers and put them on the salad. They're like, oh my gosh, you are such a gardener. Oh my gosh. Uh, Kalinja, this has a very long bloom cycle. As long as you deadhead the spit flowers. So if you sit this flower, if that's about to fade, just pinch that off to the side and it will set another flower just like that. Come right back at you. So it'll keep blooming over and over and over. Comes in this color and orange. I thought I had an orange one. Comes in this color and orange. Comes in two colors. Trust me, there's orange over there. Uh, they get about this tall, but you just do this. Use them a lot in containers. This also helps to repel insects. And it's flavor to tomatoes. It's companion for tomatoes. Butterflies like it. What else do I get? <laughs> Cilantro. You should wait to plant on cilantro. is hard to grow. Have you noticed that? Is it just me or is it you? Because I know people that are really good at it and they're going, sleazy, what's wrong with you? It's like a bragging thing. Uh, or some folks go, I just can't grow them. I think it's a water issue, soil water issue. That's one I, I, I tend to put a lot of the, the aqua boost underneath it. It does better. Um, anyway, parsley is super easy. It kind of looks the same. Doesn't taste the same, but it's, it doesn't taste the same. It looks, it, it's super easy to grow. So certain things. Uh, where else? Berries, berries, berries are here. I brought this only because it's the first roses that came in. So you got to roses. Roses grow better here, like like herbs. They like bright days, cool nights, dry. They do better than that. They are a tremendous high altitude mountain type of shrub. 
And if you've struggled to grow roses anywhere else, you won't struggle here because we don't have black spot. I've only seen one or two cases of black spot. And the Midwest, that's, that's, that's your nemesis to roses. Here we don't have that because it's dry. Mildews, you have a little bit of mildew, but it's super easy to control. You just don't have those issues that you do other parts of the country. It's just super easy to grow. We probably are famous for our roses here. I do have, you think here, Amy just told me in two weeks, like a thousand roses coming. They'll all be in bloom like this. They'll be inspiring. You'll, you'll tell because the entire front of the store will be roses because we don't have room for them anywhere else. This is kind of leading edge. And the way we shop or, or grow roses, we're trying to get a higher petal count. So many of the flowers, they're just weak, they're, they're ugly, and fragrance. They bred the fragrance out of roses to the point where they're just pretty and they don't smell good. I think a rose should smell good. It's kind of one parameter. We're allowed to sell roses as long as they smell good. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's when you get your bare root. What's that? When will you get your bare root roses? So, so bare root roses. So when do we get our bare root roses? Um, it's almost too late to get bare roots in the ground now. So that's more of a February, March thing. And we don't sell bare roots. Can I tell you why? We're noted as a place where our plants are healthier, grow better. They just live. Our plants thrive. Not just live. Our plants thrive. That's our, that's the standard. Guess what we're famous for? You'll pay a couple dollars more, but they thrive. You just know you're going to get, you're not going to waste your money, energy, put something in the ground, watch it slowly die. That's torture. That's where they put gardeners. If you're a bad person, you're a gardener, they put you in hell to watch plants die. That's a terrible torture. That's not going to be good for a gardener we, to thrive. We need to thrive. And so we were selling bare root, we are famous for thousands. And half of them come back because they didn't grow, because it was so dry. The buds were so dry, the buds were coming out of the canes, a lot of issues. And I kind of sold this. And so we took all of our bare root and we plant them up last year. We root them out and we bring them for this year. So I can guarantee you 99% success, unless you go to that Panama Canal cruise for a month and a half. It's going to live. It's just going to grow. If you're caring for it all, it's going to grow. So we, we don't sell bare root because so many were dying. It just wasn't wasn't right. Uh, our 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 um, there's I could go on and on. We have our manure. I was putting a bag of manure in a customer Mercedes, and it stumped to high heavens. Raw, like it was two ninety nine a bag, cheap. I could take off. Oh my god, here we go. Let's go. Come on. And so I put this thing in, I'm going, this is not right. There's something wrong with this. You should not have smells all the way home, and your car's going to smell like that for the next, not good. So we, we de deodorized manures. It costs a little bit more, but I don't have, I can feel proud about selling poop. <laughs> Come on, that's just something wrong with that. And so all it took was to get to compost an extra year, hold on to it for an extra year so it leaches all the. The icky stuff out. Manu Most manure you get, they put the bag to the back of the cow. And they just plant it. They see when they know you want some, it's literally how fresh it is. It's like it's a little days old. Ours is a year old. It's a year, little a year old. So anyway, this things over and over. So there are different qualities of plants. You're at the highest quality here. And we shop for quality first. Then we go for varieties that actually grow here, that are for here. It will be a lot more successful with that. Then you get into heirlooms. So I was going to mention that. So you've got hybrids and heirlooms. Kind of famous for heirlooms. Heirlooms are your grandparents took, the, so they are more disease prone. They get more leaf spots or some issues with them, but they're old fashioned. And so you can take the seed and grow it again from the seed. Hybrids, they've taken the pollen, they've taken two strong varieties. It's kind of like a husband tree of dogs when they're trying to create a chihuahua. You cross pollinate these things to come up with this unique variety that grows this kind of fruit. That's a hybrid. It's not genetically changed except the plant did it themselves. Once you isolate that, now you're trying to take those, just replicate it over and over. Those are hybrids. Hybrids are typically with breeding those for uh, consistency of fruit or disease resistance. They'll take the wind better so their stem are a little stronger. Or they want to stay shorter. So we would only want it to be a patio variety. 
So stay short. So that's determinate. The determinant only grow this big. Indeterminate is it's a vine. Tomato, tomatoes will just grow bigger than you and I, and then they'll try to keep growing into the bedroom for you. They'll just keep growing and growing and growing. Indeterminate just keeps on growing. Determinant is I've only got a small space, I'm in an apartment, I want it to be on this patio, in this container, and not outdoor space, but I want tomatoes as big. That's a patio or a dwarf variety. Those are typically hybrid types of tomatoes. I could go on and on, trivia. We're even grafting some tomatoes. We're getting really freakish into this stuff because we can take this strongest plant onto a bigger root structure. Now it takes our clay soil. We can control this kind of stuff. With that, I'll take a couple of questions. We're an hour and 12 minutes in, and then we'll kind of go. With, let's go to the back first. We'll work our way up. You can save seed from hybrid plants. Typically, they're not going to come back when you want them. They're not worth saving because uh, so, you never know what you're going to get. The genetics change. So you're not going to get an early girl tomato next time. It would be something else. What else? Yeah. When you cover your trees or your plants, you weren't talking about covering the roots. Do you not have to do that? Just Oh, uh, so if I understood you correctly, if you've got a fruit tree and it's in full bloom and you want to keep the frost off of it, how do I protect that? Do I cover the soil or the plant? You cover the plant with flowers. Protect the flowers. The soil doesn't matter. In fact, if anything, if it really is going to get cold, um, water your plant below. Because as water freezes, it releases energy. So it'll actually get you an extra degree or two of cool. Um, and then here's the magic. At 32 degrees, 32, you lose 10% of your fruit, your fruit tree. At 31 degrees, you lose about 20%. And it keeps going down. The colder goes at 28. That's the magic number. At 28, 90% of, of the fruit is gone. If the whole tree turns 28 degrees, you'll lose all the flowers you want fruit. It froze, basically. So to have a light freeze is kind of good. It thins the fruit out on the outer edge. So the energy can be forced into the ones that are remaining. Uh, otherwise, we'll cover the, the, the canopy of the tree. Sometimes you think your neighbors are crazy. They got like Christmas lights in there, a shop light. They got a light, they got a heat source underneath that canopy because they're trying to protect it. They almost create a mini greenhouse around that apple tree, peach, or nectar in your chair. Good, good question. Yeah. For basement. What's the depth of the soil? Yeah, good question. What's the depth of the soil? Raised beds. If you talk, if you're doing any kind of research, it's eight inches. I, a one block or whatever. I find that's not quite enough for big plants like potatoes, root crops like roots, like, like carrots, potatoes. They need about 12 or more inches, 12 to 16. I would say at least, at least a foot is good. Also, I find if you're growing like carrots, like I like growing carrots, I don't grow the great big long carrots.